Hello, Culture Matters Podcast. I am so excited to introduce you to our guest. But before I do that, here's a quote that I picked just for this episode. Although it's easy to forget sometimes, a share is not a lottery ticket. It's part ownership of a business. Peter Lynch. My good friend, Gary Nash, is back, advisor to myself around the talk of the street, mentor to many, business pundit, uh, has spent many years uh, interacting, navigating, learning with and from those on in and around Wall Street and business, uh, high society, a pleasant friend and a good companion. Uh, thanks for coming back to the Culture Matters podcast. I actually have a curiosity around what you think of this quote, okay? Well, and I'll repeat it, which was Peter Lynch. So he said, although it's easy to forget sometimes, a share is not a lottery ticket. It's part ownership of a business. Well, Jay, thanks for having me back uh, with you. It's good to be with you again. How you been since we last spoke? Better than good, better than most. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. So uh, it, it, it's interesting that you started off with that Peter Lynch quote there, uh, because uh, people will not understand it many, in, in many ways, especially given the climate and given the thoughts people have about Wall Street and about share ownership. And what Peter is pointing out here is that sometimes people feel that if I only own one share of stock, I'm sorry, but that's going off. My phone is going off, but that's okay. They can wait. Uh, people feel that uh, if they only own one share of stock, that that is not, it is not something that is impactful. Mm. They feel that uh, that it means nothing. And, and, and what basically Peter is saying in that quote is that that's not true. Buying into a company, when you buy a, a share into a company, you're not buying it as a lotto ticket. You're buying basically in something that you believe that's going to grow. Unlike what many think today, the stock market and investing in the stock market is not going to the casino. You are investing into the growth, into the belief of an idea, of a concept, of a profit, of, of a product, I'm sorry, that you hope will grow and expand. I can tell you at least three or four stories where one share, Somebody has bought one share has become many shares later on. Wow. In fact, um, I, I cannot, I cannot for the life of me remember uh, the actual railroad company, but I can tell you, I recall that I worked someplace and um, it was looking for, uh, uh, it was lost property, it was looking for found property. Anyway, I, I was able to locate this woman. And the, uh, what happened is the holdings belonged to her husband. And I remember speaking to her. I said, are you related to, let's say, John Doe? And this, these were shares that were bought, I guess, like 1920, 1930 in that area. Wow. And she said, yeah, he was my husband. He was, he was, and I'll, I'll, I'll embellish a little, she, a little. She says, yeah, well, he was a no good so 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 <laughs> I couldn't stand him, blah, 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 blah. And well, I, I had to tell her, I said, Well, Mrs. John Doe, do you know your husband out of every paycheck bought a share of XYZ railroad company? And those shares are now valued at a quarter million dollars. Oh my God. And she thought I was kidding. I said, no, I said, this is true. I said, out of every paycheck, he bought a little bit of a share of the stock. The stock has grown. They have split. They have added more and they have split. So your holding is now worth, a hundred. Uh, like, uh, excuse me, $250,000. And then all of a sudden she broke down crying and said, he was always a good guy. I loved him dearly. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget him. <laughs> oh, that could be a book. 
Yeah, but the, you would be surprised. That is not as rare as you think it is. I mean, I can tell you stories of where, uh, okay, even tobo tobacco stocks. People work for RJR Reynolds, which is now totally named something different. Uh, Algorin or, uh, or something like that is their name, but RJR Reynolds. And people will quote you, Daddy, you know, you know they, uh, the children inherit the stock, and they would say, Daddy said, never sell the stock. These were positions that have grown from like maybe 100 shares now to 1,000 shares. And think about people who bought, I, I say in the 80s, one share of, uh, going back to Peter Lynch, one share. Think about the people that want, bought one share of Berkshire Hathaway which probably I say in the early 1980s or mid 1980s was probably $4,000 a share. Wow. You know how much Berkshire half that one share would be valued at now? Uh, well over half a million dollars. Yeah. Close to a million dollars. That's one share. So what Peter, what, what, what Peter is pointing out is that it is not buying into a company is not, a lotto ticket. You are you are investing in in a, a philosophy. You are investing into a belief. You're investing in a product. You're investing in a solution that you believe in, and that's how the smaller investors should approach investing. This is why when I'm talking to small retail investors, I always say, whatever you pay a bill to and that you like, you buy into the company, so the company can pay you. For example, whatever utility I'll, I'll put, uh, I'll put, uh, I'll say uh, people in the New Jersey metropolitan area they know uh, PEG, Peggy, PSEG. They bill you every month, and you have to pay them. So why not buy shares in the company and let them pay you? If your cell phone service is Verizon, why not buy a Verizon stock and let them pay you? If you use a some type of service, food delivery service, you pay them, why not buy into their company and let them pay you and you grow with the company? So that's basically what Peter is saying with that. I got an, That was so juicy. I got another one for you. Here we go. You get recessions. You have stock market declines. If you don't understand that's going to happen, then you're not ready. You won't do well in the markets. Peter Lynch. He's absolutely correct with that. Uh, but, and once again, this is going back to people are being fed the mentality because it's a retail marketing thing, the average consumer, that the, the stock market is a, casino, is a casino, and it's not. You know, this is the way I tell people, especially smaller investors, to look at the market. Stocks go up and down. And you have to look at it that sometimes a stock that is that was at fifty that's now trade at fifty dollars a share that is now trading at thirty dollars a share, the stock is on sale. It's time for you to buy more. This is an opportunity to get it. You know, so so you have to look at when stocks are down. That's an opportunity to buy more. Stocks are on sale and to build your holdings. People forget. Going uh, just to educate some people who might be listening, a round lot of stock is 100 shares. Okay, that's a round lot of shares. So when you're talking about really small investors, going back to the uh, the woman's husband that worked as a, a worked for this railroad company, at the time he might not have been able to afford 100 shares when he was buying stock, but out of his paycheck he took. $5 and $5 bought how many, whatever percentage of a share. Anyway, he did that consistently. He did that steady and he built and built and built and built and built. And although he might not have benefited from it, his wife, who now speaks, <laughs> she's probably dead and gone, but who now speaks just lovely things about him now, <laughs> his family benefited from it. So from what, from that little bit, uh, it, 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 it just, it, it, where would it you say emotion to... plays into it? Uh, I would say emotion pay, plays into the stock market when you're talking, when you bring in the greed factor. I mean, if I'm going to, 
let me just use a, 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 a telephone carrier, for example. If I'm a big AT&T fan, right? And I'm saying you have to keep it, of course you have to keep an eye on your holding and stuff like that, but I believe in AT&T. So no matter what, just like uh, parents used to tell their children that own RJ, RJ rental stock, don't sell the stock. Just invest, 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 invest. I, I mean, you sell off the dividend. You, 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 pretty soon, depending on what stock, you make dividends from that. That you can spend or you sell off new shares that you can spend, but don't sell off the original holding. But if I'm the, if I'm the type of person, I'm looking at the papers every day and XYZ stock is 30, but then today it's like 30 and a half. And I'm like, ooh, 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 I've made 50 cents. Multiply that by 100. I'm selling the stock. <laughs> that's that's when you're saying emotion is playing to it. Mm. Or I've spent $3,000, right? And uh, the stock has dropped a dollar. I've lost a hundred. I've basically lost a hundred dollars. If we're talking about a hundred shares, oh my boy, I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm going to sell. I'm going to sell. Whereas I, my belief is that you look at that as an opportunity to buy more because the stock is on sale. What role does the board play for a public company, or roles? It depends on the company. Many times, uh, when you're looking at a public company, a public company wants to bring. To to uh, uh, I would say the CEO, who's normally the chairman of the board, wants to bring a certain expertise that is missing within the company, or or have access to something that the company does not have access to, like, like talent or 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 a skill set. I mean, you could have the best product. Uh, let's look at let, let's take a a a. a, a Let's use an electrical vehicle company, XYZ electrical vehicle company. You might be making the best electrical vehicle that's, that's ever been created. However, you don't have access to a marketing talent or you don't have access to a banker to bring uh, to to expand the company. So therefore, you want you want to bring somebody on your board of directors that's going to have access to that avenue to get the company to move the company there. That's one way to look at it. You want to bring a talent and a skill set that the company is missing. Or or another thing that you want to uh, uh, look at from a public company for a board of directors, you want the experience of people that have been in business. If I'm a new business that's skyrocketing, I want to listen to the experience of someone who has had 20 or 30 years of business and how they could direct me to go the right way and can move the business to grow. Then you have people that have access to uh, on the board of directors. If someone is uh, very heavily or their, their experience was heavily involved in government contracts, they might have access to that or they might have access to the international market. You want to build a board where you're bringing bringing something that's to the table, that something's bringing something to the table that does not exist in the company. And then that's where we speak about diversity also, meaning that let's call it what it was and, and, and what it is to a great extent, even to this day, although things are changing for the better. Your board of directors normally consisted of, let's make up a number, eight white males and a white male that was the CEO. Mm that were making pantyhose for women and women. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so, okay. Then somebody woke up and said, you know, why don't we have a, 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 a few women or at least one woman on this board that can tell us how the product is or what the, what the needs are the women that they need. That's a skill set. So, you know, it's the same thing with uh, diversity as far as race, ethnicity or something like that. If I'm making, if my product is Asian food retail, wouldn't it help to know something to possibly have someone that might come from that type of background that can contribute to something that I don't know? So, so mm. you, you, well, once again, you you want to compose a board that is bringing a skill set or a talent that is not in the company from an everyday point of view. So that's what public companies try to do. How do boards go astray? What are some of the... Many times boards go astray when, because uh, keep in mind, the board, 
<laughs> this is the thing. When you're talking about a public company, the shareholders are the owners of the company, not the chief executive officer or the, uh, 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 the chief executive officer is technically an employee of the shareholders and they work for the company. The board of directors, their primary objective is to look out for the benefit of the shareholders. So how does a board go astray when you have a CEO that basically, I would say, uh, controls his board, but puts a, put in board members that are just friends of his that are going to do whatever he says. They're not, they're not looking out for the benefit. And I should say he, she says, uh, they're not looking out for the benefits of the shareholders, but they're looking to do the bidding of the CEO. And that's not, that's not what the board does. The board is, uh, is working on behalf of the shareholders. One perfect example I can give of that and, uh, um, Hewlett Packard many years ago when uh, Hewlett Packard hired Carly Fiorina. Uh, whatever you think of her tenure, it didn't work out well. And um, it was a difficult time for Hewlett Packard at that time because Carly, for they had elected one of the first female CEOs to run a Fortune 500 company. Wow. So they had the marketing of that to go to, you know, they had to deal with that because her decisions were not in the best interest of the company. The stock was tanking, shareholders were screaming and, you know, they had to fire her, but you had the pressure. How do you fire like the first female CEO of a fortune 500 company? Mm. Well, at that time, the chairman of the company just happened to be a female. Two, but see, let's not even dismiss that. The board of directors had to come out and say, look, we do not work for you. We work for the shareholders and whatever your decisions are doing, you're destroying shareholder value. And so we have to fire you. And that's 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 the whole thing. That, that, that was a tough decision for the, that board to make because they knew the social pressure that they would be getting. You know, they would be firing like... Uh, Carla Fiorina was like, if, like, if not the first, one of the first female CEOs of a Fortune 500 company. We were talking about, we're talking about Hewlett Packard at that time, but her decisions that she made, mm. whatever you want to think about them, some people might argue, well, you didn't give it enough time to play out. You didn't get, you know, or they were just bad decisions. Whatever, it was destroying the stock. It was really killing the morale of the company. And shareholders said, do something. And they were saying, do something to the board of directors. So they fired her. Gary. Because the board of directors, they work for the shareholders. Because. Because why? Their job is to maintain shareholder and enhance shareholder value. That's what they're looking at. Because it is the shareholders who own the company. Not the CEO, not Carly Fiorino, whoever you want to name, you know. Look, we could be, we, she, she and I, we could have been best friends. She could have slept over my house, play, her kids played mm. with my kids and loved her dearly and everything like that. Went to her, her went to her party. She came to mine. But if I'm, if I'm a, a board, a, a board member, I have to put that aside. Our friendship aside or our like aside, whatever her decisions were doing was not in the best interest of the shareholders and of the company. And my job, my fiduciary job as a board of director is to protect the company and to protect the shareholder. So I would have to vote to fire. Wow. I, is it is part of it because when we go, when the organization uh, entice, uh, opens up to the public and says, hey, come with us on this journey, there's another level of accountability because they're asking for money to do that. And so they're involving other partners. They have to look at oh, their absolutely. partners, their partners in this journey at that point. I'm sure trying to make it simple for the audience, right? Like these bigger concepts are. Well, absolutely. This is, this is why uh, uh, going back to Peter Lynch's con, uh, 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 quote that you mentioned at the top of the program, buying one share is not buying a lotto ticket. Whether you own one share or whether you own a thousand shares, you you are part owner of this company. You know, 
Listen, if I only own one share of AT and T, my vote might not go far, but I am an owner in this company, you know, and so, and and I am just as important, theoretically. You know, as it makes the me think. A thousand of, shares. It makes me think of like a country, like your vote matters. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can think you can think about that. Yeah, I mean, I never thought of it that way till right now, so clearly. But it's like. Our country, our vote matters. And in countries where our vote doesn't matter, we don't feel good. We don't feel a part of the culture. We don't feel, and we might not have the freedom that we have or want or so. It's an interesting thought experiment. Well, you're, you're right. You you can basically equate the two because, I mean, you've and many people have heard the thing, well, if you don't vote, you don't have a say. That's very true. But then you hear many times when people say, well, my vote doesn't matter. Yes, your vote does matter. If matter. nothing else, it should matter to you. I agree with that. Yeah, you know, uh, I mean, that's it. And so when when mm -hmm. you don't vote, you're basically saying, I don't matter. And that's not true. You do matter because you can vote. And that's just the same thing with a shareholder. I own one share. If I'm against something, I might lose, but I'm registering my share and what I want, how I want to vote. And so, yeah, it doesn't matter. Gary, thank you for coming back uh, to the Culture Matters podcast. I can't wait for next time already. Uh, just in closing, you know, if you were to put this, wrap this in a bow for the audience, what, what takeaway would you say, you know, something actionable? Well, I, I would say, I, I would say what's actionable, no matter how, how small a shareholder or a share that you own in a company that you are important and that you do matter, uh, and 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 that um, look at investing in the market as an investment, not as a gambling, not as a casino. It is an investment. You believe in something. You believe in the person. You believe in the idea. You believe in the product. You believe in the solution. So that's the way you want to invest. And then also, then you know, like uh, we didn't go into it, but then um, you know. We talked about public companies, but then uh, one of the things, too, as as your investment grows, you want to always remember to give back to, you know, what is growing with you. You know, you got to. So, you know, we didn't get into the charitable board, charitable, charitable yeah. boards and stuff like that. But it's the same thing. You know, people volunteer. They're giving their time because they're looking out. They want to grow. They want to help. They want to expand something. So, you know, 